Welcome to our next episode of this Revival History series. Today we're going to be talking about a move of God in South Africa. I want to take you right into a story that is in the beginnings of this move of God. And I think these stories are so inspiring because they show us that revival is not always this perfectly planned and executed thing that everyone saw coming and it was just really well led. Often it's totally unforeseen. Often it's a very small beginnings and very humble. And that is the case here as in, as in many other stories. So let's just jump right in. Pastor's leading his congregation in a service. They've uh, read some scripture. He's prayed a few prayers. They've sang a few hymns and he wants to open it up for his congregation. But he finds a 15-year-old girl who's ethnically African. She raises her hand and she wants to share. And he's uncomfortable with it because of her age. Not sure what the rest of the congregation is going to think. But all of a sudden he decides, yeah, I'm going to let her do it. So she begins to share this scripture, share this passage on her heart. And as she does, he describes it as if like a rushing wind. He called it a deafening roar began to fill the room. And as it did, everyone in the room spontaneously begins to cry out and starts to pray audibly, which was not traditional and had never happened before. So now they're all out loud praying. And he says, louder than the sound of the prayer, though, was this deafening roar that he doesn't even know what it was to this day. And I love this quote. Years later, he says, a feeling which I cannot describe took possession of me. Even now, 43 years after these occurrences, the events of that never-to-be-forgotten night pass before my mind's eye like a soul-stirring panorama. I feel again as I then felt and cannot refrain from pushing back my chair and thanking the Lord fervently for His mighty deeds. <clears throat> that moment would mark kind of a catalytic prayer gathering that would spread across the nation. But this specific story is not over. It's pretty incredible. Uh, Andrew Murray, who was actually the presiding pastor over that church, he catches uh, the wind of what's happening. In fact, someone runs for him and says, hey, you've got to come in the church. Something's happening. He comes in the back of the church. Everybody's praying out loud audibly. It's chaos, and he doesn't like it. He walks right up to the man who's leading the prayer meeting, says, what's happening here? And the man goes, I don't know, tries to explain to him what happened, and he's totally disappointed. And the man, the man who's leading the prayer meeting gets back down on his knees and says to himself, if this is God, I am getting out of the way. Andrew Murray begins to walk the halls of his church, and the first thing he does is he yells at the top of his lungs, silence, and nobody stops even an ounce. The prayer keeps on rumbling. He keeps pacing around a little bit longer, and then he says again, I am your minister, silence, and nobody stops. The prayer keeps rumbling. A third time he shouts, God is a God of order, and this is chaos. The prayer keeps going, and Andrew Murray leaves the building. And you're wondering, how do you go from that meeting, which is obviously a, a pretty remarkable move of God, but Andrew Murray's response, how does he become one of the foremost authors on prayer and the catalyst to this revival across South Africa? We're going to jump into the episode and you're going to find out a little bit more. Okay, before we jump into this story, I want to give you three points to look for as application points. Number one is uh, we have to give up our fear and discomfort with how God wants to move in our midst. Number two is we see in this story and many times in history, spiritual awakening heals division. Number three, we're going to talk about how spiritual awakening, revival, um, always lead to a renewing of Great Commission fervor and to a whole new launching of missions movements. Okay, here we go into this story. Um, there's always something as you dive in and the more you read and the more you, you know, find a new book or a new article, whatever it may be, there's always something way back in the beginning you're just stunned by. And it's rarely the thing that made the headlines. It's rarely the person that the main books are written about. But certainly, heaven is aware that those simple acts of obedience are the very things that catalyze these moves of God. And one of those things you find in South Africa is a man named Andrew Murray Sr. 
uh, the famous Andrew Murray's father. And for 38 years, Andrew Murray Sr. had set apart every single Friday night to pray for revival and a move of God in South Africa. Now, I think sometimes we can read that or hear that and go, that's awesome. Um, I get it. You know, I do things on a weekly basis and not really realize the depth of that commitment. If you think about all the things going on on a Friday night, all the temptations to, um, to run other directions, to maybe just give that up, and then think about that you're 10 years into that commitment and there's not even a stirring of revival. You're 20 years into that and churches are emptier than they've ever been. You're 30 years into that and it's said of uh, this region of South Africa, division is off the charts. People hate prayer meetings and don't even come to them. No young people are in the churches. And, and, and Andrew Murray Sr. has been praying every Friday night for 30 years. I think there's a tremendous lesson on endurance for us in this story to never give up believing in the promises of God. And if we won't give up, God certainly is never giving up. So for 38 years, Andrew Murray Sr. is paving a foundation and intercession. I can't imagine how much that commitment affected Andrew Murray Jr., who would become world famous for his writing and his life on prayer. 38 years in, we're now in the early, uh, late 1850s and early 1860s, and the stories of what's happening in the Layman's Prayer Revival in New York and what's happening in the Ulster Revival in Ireland start flooding into South Africa. And there's a number of leaders who are stirred with this expectation for a move of God, but when those testimonies land, their expectation goes to a whole new level. And they essentially say what many others have said in history, God, if you can do it there, you can do it here. And they begin to move in a fresh faith. There's a key gathering in 1859 of pastors, over 300, that gather together and they decide that all of their churches and all of their influence is going to be used to preach on the power of the Holy Spirit and the necessity of spiritual awakening and revival. In fact, they write a book together on the power of prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit. Between all the messages that begin to go out and this book spreading around the area, all of a sudden something begins to shift in the churches of the region. Prayer meetings begin to pop up, they begin to get populated, and so many stories of prayer rooms being too filled, they had to move to bigger rooms and bigger rooms and bigger rooms. Finally, sometimes there's six, eight, or ten prayer meetings going on in any given town on the same night because the fervor for prayer began to grow all over the region. Now, let's talk about Andrew Murray again. He's one of these elite pastors. He's a phenomenal communicator, but it actually says before the South African revival, he was known as a great communicator with very little power. And I, I find that really interesting. He was phenomenal as an orator and a Bible preacher, but he was known to kind of try and push things with his own energy, his own strength. And there was very rarely any kind of a move of the spirit when he would preach. So I told you the story of his frustration with his church that's now in this audible, wild, kind of reckless prayer meeting. Well, it's just a short time later that he's leading another service and uh, they're going through the motions as they always did, a little bit of Bible, some hymns, and then they move into prayer and the same thing happens. All of a sudden, the whole room is caught up in a chorus of intercession. People are in travail. It's emotional. It's uncomfortable. Um, people are, are what they they would say they were they were um, they fell to the ground they were they were slain they said they didn't know what to call it they like stricken in the Ulster revival people were just falling to the ground in repentance and crying out to God and Andrew Murray's there and he's uncomfortable with it this is so critical for where we are right now for far too long we have taken too much comfort maybe in our denominational backgrounds or in how we grew up or you know kind of where we would put ourselves theologically and anything that falls outside of that box or outside of that perimeter we're uncomfortable with and we often will say maybe it's not God or we'll blame it on emotionalism or we'll say it's just those wild people over there and we can kind of hold an arm out to things that we're uncomfortable with I'm telling you we will never ever see a move of God unless we are willing to die to our comforts and let God be God. You have to ask yourself the question, where in the world can God be totally unhindered? 
Where can he be completely himself? If you love being yourself among your closest friends, how much more is God looking for a place where he can fully be himself? But you have to wonder, are there places on the earth right now that are comfortable if God was fully himself? This is the tension that Andrew Murray finds himself in. He is not comfortable with what he sees around him. He wants to call it emotionalism. He wants to call it not God. But he's sitting there watching it now. It's the second time it's happened. And something so incredible, something so remarkable happens in this meeting. A stranger sitting in one of the back rows gets Andrew Murray's attention. He shares with him, he says, hey, I've just come from America and I've seen very similar things happening there. And the fruit of it is unbelievable. And he says to Andrew Murray, don't stop this. This is God. This was the last time that was ever recorded that Andrew Murray tried to stop one of these prayer meetings. And what's wild is in the years to come, he would become the major advocate, catalytic voice, teacher and preacher of the South African revival. It said in some of these documents that he took six months to kind of ponder and wrestle with and immerse himself in the revival before he actually started preaching on it. I think there's a lesson in this. He wasn't quick to all of a sudden go, hey, I understand it all and now I'm the leading voice. This happened in my church. No, he just, he let himself be immersed in it. He got the heart of God. He got the mind of Christ. And when he felt that he had understanding of what was God, God was doing, he became a major voice of it. Now, the fruit of this thing was quite remarkable. So many things can be pointed to, kind of your classic reformation of communities where uh, bars are shut down, alcoholism drops, you know, to almost nothing. It was said that in many of these towns, which they say over 35 towns were affected by the revival. That's a lot of towns uh, in one nation to be swept in two waves of revival. And it was said that in many of those towns, there wasn't a single home that didn't have a new convert because of the prayer meetings and the revival that was occurring. That's incredible. Think about your town you're in right now and imagine if every single home in that town had someone who had come to salvation or gone wholehearted after Jesus because of the prayer meetings and the revival. One of the remarkable fruits of this was that Af- South Africa at the time um, was, had major divisions, social economic divisions, racial divisions, major prejudices towards women. In fact, at this time, women were not allowed to pray out loud in meetings. Of course, that was obliterated when these prayer meetings began to explode all across the nation. But what happened was in these prayer meetings, you could walk into the back of a church and find people from a broad social economic background, the poor and the wealthy right next to each other. You could find those from various ethnic groups that had long standing divisions and hatred standing next to each other in worship, in prayer, in going after God. This was a remarkable part of the fruit of this time in South Africa. We live in a day where we are desperately in need um, for a healing of the divisions in our world. Denominational divisions, political divisions, ethnic divisions, it's all over the place. It's worship and prayer that would pull us together, spiritual awakening that would draw us together, and this happened in South Africa. So much fruit from simple prayer meetings that led to mass salvation, mass reformation. Now, real quick, before we end this episode, let's just look at the chain of events that have occurred um, in the Layman's Prayer Revival, the Ulster Revival, and now the South Africa Revival. And I just want you to, I want to walk you back for a moment because uh, it was already several episodes that we talked about a key person in the layman's prayer revival called Jeremiah Lamphere. And I just want to walk you into that moment one more time where Jeremiah Lamphere walks down the streets of New York City overwhelmed with the loss of spirituality, asking himself a question, can a city be turned back to God? Can a nation turn its course and actually head back towards God? And he gets this dream, this idea, walking down the crowded streets of his city and goes, maybe if they would experience the refreshing power of prayer, they would turn their hearts back to God. Hands out 60,000 flyers. Think of all the doors that were knocked on because of the passion and the simple obedience in Jeremiah Lamphere's heart. But remember, his first prayer meeting had six people at it by the end of the hour. So I just want you to remember that moment, the emotion, the excitement, the discouragement, the frustration, but also the endurance and the perseverance, having had no idea when he finished that first prayer meeting with six participants, that entire continents would be touched by the simple obedience that he had walked out, having no idea that that 
failure of a prayer meeting would actually spread across three continents, touching numerous nations, leading to millions of salvations, breaking the back of division, releasing reformation, and literally catalyzing change that we are still living in today because Jeremiah Lamphere didn't give up after a small prayer meeting. This is a tremendous encouragement to us today. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Stay obedient, stay perseverant, stay in endurance. God is faithful. And if we won't give up, the rains will fall. We believe we're living in a day of great harvest, that God's gonna move across the earth like he did in these stories. And now is the time for us to rise up in faithfulness and perseverance and endurance and believe that God's about to pour out his spirit across the nations the earth. Before we wrap up this episode, let's talk about three personal applications. Number one is uh, remember that meeting that Andrew Murray is really uncomfortable with what's happening. Uh, This is something that God wants to open us up to right now is that we have our preconceived notions of how revival would come, how his spirit would move. We've got our definitions of what's okay and what's not okay. And what God did in South Africa, Andrew Murray was not okay with. And he was in danger of possibly missing the entire move of God and not only missing it, but becoming like an adversary to the move of God. And thankfully, he realized his his ways. He realized he had some serious discomforts that were hindering him and he dealt with them. And instead, he becomes a catalyst to the move of God. Right now, there may be things in our own lives where we're thinking it has to come this way. We've kind of put God in a box. Like, hey, if you're going to move, I know it's going to look like this. I know it'll come from this group, and I I know it'll feel like this. And God's saying, would you just shatter the boxes and let me be God? It might come from an area, a group, a denomination, a certain church, or a, a certain group in our city that we're not that excited about, or we have already have walls up towards. And instead of judging, we should be the first to run to anything that looks like, feels like, seems like an authentic move of God, humble ourselves, learn from it, and allow ourselves to be led into what God's really doing. So let's let our walls be broken down. Let's let our boxes be broken. And let's just declare together, let God be God. Let revival come and let it come, God, however you want to bring it. You are God. I am man. And I just want you to come. Number two is we see the power of prayer in the South African revivals to heal the racial divisions. Again, today we see division in many levels across uh, the church and across our nations. And it is prayer and the presence of God, the glory of God, that often is meant to bring us together. So even as we look at a, a greater spiritual awakening coming right now in this season of history, it's so important that we are dealing with every prejudice and every division that we would have in our lives. God hates every form of prejudice. He hates racism. He hates it when we put up walls towards our brothers and sisters. So what are the walls you need to destroy in your life right now to prepare the way for the outpouring of the glory of God? Number three, we see in the South African revival, and I didn't talk as much about it, but they're actually in the theology that they had pre-revival. They had no room for missions. It didn't make sense to them. They had no burden for those who were lost or other nations or other people groups. Well, when the revival hit, missions fervor hit with it. And mission societies were started all over the area. In the next number of years, tens of thousands of new baptisms, um, thousands of schools were started and nations surrounding them and communities surrounding them. Thousands of teachers were trained. uh, Thousands of students were educated. The gospel advanced rapidly because of the spiritual awakening and the renewed passion for the Great Commission. What does this say to us right now? Is that every time there's spiritual awakening, there's a renewal of the Great Commission. The Great Commission is not just a suggestion. It's not just for a few. The very heart and ethos of Commission the City is the raising up and the empowering of the everyday believer. That means that the Great Commission is for every single one of us. And throughout history, when there's been spiritual awakening, there's been a renewed mindset that it is absolutely thoroughly Christian to consider the places of the earth that have had very little gospel access as our responsibility. We see that in South Africa. Move of God comes, all of a sudden their eyes are open and they go, it is our responsibility to take the gospel where it's not gone before. In this hour, 
There is a renewal of the Great Commission rising up in the heart of the generation, in the heart of the church, to recognize that there are areas of our cities, areas of our nations, and nations of the world that have been little touched by the gospel, and they are our privilege, and they are our responsibility. We believe together we're heading into the greatest hour of the Great Commission in all of human history, and we should expect every person listening to this, you have a tremendous part to play in obeying the Great Commission.